Yes, Counsel. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the Court, Brendan Forgo on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honors, in this case, the Appeals Court either misread or ignored its, this Court's clear precedent as well as its own and held for the first time it, that in Chapter 123A makes the hearsay reports of petitioners hired experts admissible. It does not, and this Court should reverse the Appeals Court's ruling. The Appeals Court decision hinges on a, a really surprising misreading of its own precedent, a case from 2007 called Starkus. Uh, this Appeals Court indicated that they're bound by the decision in that case um, and went on to say that the psychologist's reports from that case um, are admissible as psychiatric or psychological records. The problem is that there were two psychologist reports at issue in Starkus, and the Appeals Court simply seems to have factually mixed them up. Um, the first case, um, and the case that was deemed to be admissible in the Starkus case, was a, was a report called the Pildes Report. Now, in Starkus, the petitioner in that case um, had been, uh, decades prior, been found to be um, guilty of an assault and battery from a charge that stemmed from a rape of a child. He was sentenced to two years in the House of Correction and was also um, required to undergo psychotherapy with Dr. Pildes as a condition of his parole. Um, so in the Starkus case, the Pildes report was a report that was written decades prior um, and under court order and was exactly the type of report that this court discussed when talking about hearsay issues in McCool, a previously written report in the record that experts who are going to look at the, the issue of current sexual dangerousness are required to rely upon or are able to rely upon in reaching their opinion. The appeals court in Starkus correctly um, found that that report was admissible, and both the parties agreed that it was admissible in Starkus. The other expert report in Starkus was the report of a, a petitioner's hired expert, Dr. Plaud, who was hired specifically to reach an opinion on sexual opinions on sexual dangerousness for the Starkus case. That report was excluded at trial based on, among other things, some discovery violations, and the court upheld the exclusion of Dr. Plaud's report, saying that even though Dr. Plaud may have the qualifications of a qualified examiner, the only entity able to make him a qualified examiner and thus make his report admissible is the Department of Correction, and the Commissioner of the Department of Correction had not done so. So if you take Starkus, which the Appeals Court tent seems to do, and read it in full, the Commonwealth wins on this issue. What well, let me Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll go. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Section 14C, it talks about uh, psychological records and reports. Th yes. These are the, you know, the initial uh, commitment hearing. Right. Uh, psychological records and reports can get admitted in evidence, and also any other evidence tending, uh, any other evidence tending to show that such person is or is not right. sexual, a sexually dangerous person. Section nine, section nine doesn't have that language. Right. It just talks about psychological records. Uh, and it just talks about other evidence tending to show that such person is sexually dangerous. Why is that an oversight, or why would they? Why would the legislature treat uh, defendants in these cases differently at a discharge hearing? I could probably come up with an answer to that, but I'll tell you that the Commonwealth essentially does not argue that there should be a difference between those two. The appeals court actually asked for, uh, for supplemental briefs on this issue, and we don't argue that someone, uh, you know, because it says is or is not sexually dangerous in 14, but is in 9, that's a, that there's a difference in that. What we argue is that the Reese case indicates that anything under the is or is not exception needs to be independently admissible, and the, and the reports of hired um, experts for these cases are not in independently admissible. There's just there's simply nothing in the law in Why the case. Why is this fair, though? Why is that fair? Because the scheme is entirely fair, Your Honor. Uh, what, <coughs> what, what, what we have in any Section 9 case is the statute requires that any petitioner in a Section 9 case be evaluated by at least four, but in practice it's generally seven, independent psychologists who reach an opinion as to that person's sexual and dangerousness. And two qualified examiners and two or more others? Is that what you're saying? Two qualified examiners, at least two members of the CAB, in practice all five members of the CAB are generally licensed psychologists. So what goes before the jury is the two qualified examiners' reports <coughs> and the CAB report, correct? Exactly. And this exactly. is fair? This is absolutely fair. As because this court has stated in Johnstone, this court made, made the point in Johnstone saying I, I know that, what it says in Johnstone, but this is talking about what's in front of the jury. Right. And so they listen to all the testimony, 
and they get it regurgitated again in writing, and if it's the if it's the qualified examiner report and the CAB report, it goes back forever and repeats all that hearsay again and again and again and again. They've got all of that in front of them, and they can't have these other two reports. The difference is qualified examiners and the CAB, when they reach an opinion, when they look at a man and they reach an opinion whether they're sexually dangerous or not sexually dangerous, their opinion goes before the jury either way. If they reach the opinion that they're not sexually dangerous, they are able, the petitioner is able to call them to testify on their behalf. If the CAB has a split decision, uh, say it's a three to two or four to one decision, two members of the CAB go and testify, one saying that he's sexually dangerous and one saying that he's not sexually dangerous. When a petitioner hires an expert, or two experts in these cases. If that expert reaches the opinion that the person is sexually dangerous, obviously the Commonwealth never gets that report, can't call that person, and the person does not testify. So there's a, there's a real difference in the, in, in the type of, of evidence that you're getting from the qualified examiners and the CAB as opposed to hired experts. But, but, but they, the, 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 it seems to me that, that the flavor of uh, 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 or the, the court's imprimatur goes on to the, um, uh, the, the, the testimony and the reports of the qualified examiners because both the reports uh, and the testimony gets put to the jury. But on the defendants, of, uh, when, when you look at the defendants' experts, those reports don't get to go before the jury, and the jury is, is a, you know, gets the sense that these guys are either junior varsity players uh, or they're, they're not to be believed they're, because we're treating them differently. There's well, something wrong with that. In this case, there was the, the court offered to give an instruction explaining that it's simply a statutory construction. Oh, but that, that, just, that just exacerbated the problem, her, well, it was, her instruction. It was, I, 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 would, I would argue, differently. And the, didn't it the, do just what Justice Bina said? It gives the imprimatur to the, these reports saying the legislature said you should get these, but you're not going to get anything else. I mean that's that's what the legislature said. So uh, it's it seems it seems clear. I think that in a case like this, where all of the experts who are statutorily required to look at, at at the petitioner in this case, they all found that he was sexually dangerous. It may seem that there is some kind of uh, unfairness here because there's a difference. But as happens all the time since since Santos, if the Commonwealth uh, doesn't have a qualified examiner, it can't go forward. And if their qualified examiners are split. There, are the the petitioner gets an expert, you know, and and so it's not. I think it's a mistake to look at just the facts of this case and look at the scheme. <clears throat> the scheme is completely fair because there's, like as I said, there's seven um, independent experts whose opinions come in either way in every case. Does the Commonwealth get to to hire its own um, qualified examiner? I would argue that. Um, well, the Commonwealth doesn't hire the qualified examiners. No, I think no, the, no. The, I mean, out of right. your budget, do you get to pick and hire, apart from the ones that are selected by the court and da 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 do you get to hire your expert as if this were an insanity defense? I think we could, but in practice we don't. And I think that if we did, that person's expert, that person's report would not be admissible either because there's simply nothing in the statute that would allow for it. It would be just like... Um, the the uh, experts hired by petitioners in these cases. But, but, but getting back to the statutory interpretation, it's your view that um, uh, uh, that the uh, that the differences between section 14 and section 9, um, uh, with respect to reports and records, and with respect to um, uh, pre presenting reports or any evidence that is or is that, that indicates that the defendant either is or is not a sexually dangerous person, they should be read qualitatively equally. They should be read the same. It, it, it doesn't make it sense the and other way. We, we, we briefed this in, in the supplemental brief to the appeals court. And, 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 and to follow up on that, then you can see that, all, that the absence of the word reports then in section 9 is of no consequence. We should read, we should read records to include reports. I think that records and reports, it, there's, there's, I, I have a difficult time finding the distinction between the two. Okay, so because records should, may be reports, reports may be records. So, 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 so we should read it to include, we should read it as if it says psychiatric and psychological records and reports. I don't see the, the distinction okay. between the and, two. And, I mean, and, and based and why, on, I mean, what you're asking us to do essentially is to read in language that says except those reports that are made in connection with the litigation. That's essentially what you're asking us to do. 
No, I'm, I'm just asking you not to read in language that the petitioner's expert's reports are, are admissible, because what, what is it to not, do it that is, way... Is it not a psychiatric or psychological report? It's, not if it's not if it's created in not if it's created in in um, for for the for litigation. But no. isn't the, aren't the aren't the QE ones also? Yes, but they are, the, the the legislature has indicated that they should be admissible, and that's a, that's a legislative decision that they're, that they're certainly able to make for the reason for the reasonable reasons that I've that I've set forward. They're, they're in a different position. Johnstone, this court made very clear that the, the qualified examiners are the established as independent court appointed experts. They're the ones that are that are um, that are the important um, evaluators here. But don't the, the, this court uh, set them above. Uh, yeah. Under a Section 14 proceeding, do, don't the defendant's psychiatrist or psychologist reports get admitted into evidence? Um, there's nothing in the statute that indicates that they that they do. What it, the statute does is allows for them to be hired and sets forth um, discovery requirements. Um, so what it says is if if they intend to rely on the report or testimony of the experts, here's what they have to do for discovery in order for that to happen. I have no doubt that courts um, do allow them in. But I think every time they do that, there's, there's nothing in the statute to support it. Well, the, but, but Section 14 is drafted a little differently in another respect because it talks about psychiatric and psychological records and reports right. of the person named in, its, in the petition. So I guess that goes to Justice Gantz's question as to whether you think Section 9, essentially whether or not the words are there, is the same thing. Given any particular document, you know, it might be a record, it might be a report, or like I said, a report might be a record. Uh, it's to me, it's it's a distinction really without a difference. A report um, of the person could include a recently prepared report in connection with the litigation. That's a report. It probably isn't a record. It isn't a psychological record. Probably not. It could be. It, it, it could be. I think it could be argued either way, honestly. But I mean, but I, I guess my, my question is, why should we read in the language? You want us to read in language that essentially says records prepared for the purposes of treatment or alternatively records not prepared for purposes of litigation. The legislature didn't include, didn't include that limitation, and, well, and, and why should we? Well, I don't, I, don't think, um, I don't think, Your Honor, that that's what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, is to follow the, the statute as it's written and not read out the entire section on the CAB and the QEs. If, if the legislature intended for any report written for the purposes of litigation to be included, then there would be no need to specifically include the reports of the QEs and the CAB. They would just have said psychological records and reports. You could read it the way um, you're, you're suggesting, and then everybody's would come in. But they didn't do that. They specifically said the CAB report is admissible, the QE reports are admissible. So if we read it the way that you're suggesting, you're making a nullity of that entire section, and, and that's that's clearly not the intent of the legislature. Well, I mean, you say that, but respectfully, in Reese, this court made a nullity of the last section of tends to indicate that he's a sexual person. <laughs> well, uh, so it's not as if we haven't said that they, what they wrote was a nullity before. I think this is a this would be a in in Reese. I mean, we're talking about the difference between those two, the the the, the strange difference in drafting between nine and fourteen. I think that that's you know that's a different uh, different animal than what we're talking about here. Let me ask you this, just take, taking a step back. So the qualified examiners, well, are, are the QE reports admissible even if the qualified examiners don't testify? Um, no, there's a case that indicates that um, in order for any um, expert uh, report to come in, the author has to be available for, for cross-examination. So um, in general, they no. I okay. think it's Bradway. And, and the QE reports that do come in, uh, do, can they cover areas that are not covered in the examination of the, of the examiner. So the QE, the qualified examiner gets up and testifies this, that, and right. the other thing. There's cross-examination. Then the report comes in and includes a whole section on things that weren't even touched on in the direct or cross-examination. Do they have to be they don't have to. Out? They don't have to um, testify to every word of their report, if that's what you're asking. When they do their evaluation, and I think this is true of everybody, they have access to all of the records that are available at the treatment center. They have an uh, interview, and they, they so basically the reports look at are the not persons. redacted in any, in any way? No, they can be redacted if, for example, there is a, a dismissed case um, that, or a null prost case, or if sometimes uh, th there's, there are things that get redacted, um, you know, uh, but, it, but generally, it goes back over the entire history. Doesn't yes, 
Yes. Including and all the hearsay that's in the records. Yes. Uh, following McCool. Yeah, no, uh, no. Because for the reasons that are obviously well laid out in McCool. Um, uh, I see my, my time is short. Um, I was no, your time is up. <laughs> my time is yes. up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning again. Uh, Michael Fellows for Hugo Santos. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start in this case actually with the prejudice that arose from um, the prevention of my client's experts' reports being put into, a, into evidence. And it's something that isn't mentioned in the appeals court decision. I, I believe Justice Speedin is exactly right in the appeals court decision mentions this, that, um, that by, by keeping those reports out, it, it lends an imprimatur of, of, of reliability to the government's reports. Um, but there's actually a specific uh, instance of, of identifiable prejudice in this case. And I think it raises a danger that will exist as long as uh, uh, the private psychiatric uh, experts' reports are kept out in these cases. At one point, um, the, um, I don't want to call him a prosecutor, the, the Commonwealth's attorney um, cross-examined Dr. Prentke, one of, one of the experts, and asked him who, who the last uh, victim in this case was. And um, Dr. Prentke said victim four. He actually said her name, but victim four. And then the, the uh, attorney showed him page four of his report. And there's a section in there where it says uh, the last, uh, last crimes or something like that. And that lists um, victim, actually, he said victim five. That's the last one. That lists the last crime as victim four. And... Uh, the um, assistant attorney general, actually, that's what they are, said, that's not correct, is it? And then Dr. Prentke tried to say, I was only referring to up until the time of the governing offense, which is the offense that leads to this hearing in the first place. Um, okay, so that's, that's all that happens in, in uh, examination. In closing argument, um, the attorney general said to the jury, you're not going to get the defendant's reports or the petitioner's reports because uh, that's what the legislature says. But I pointed out a few things. And one of those was when asked who the final victim was, um, uh, Dr. Prentke said victim four. First of all, that's not what he said. He said victim five. Um, but also, the, the basis for that uh, charge that Dr. Prentke was wrong was on a reading of the report and it was a partial reading of the report. Uh, it was only on looking at page four of the report uh, where these, these final crimes are listed that you could say that he didn't know who the last uh, victim was. The governing offense part on page three of the report was never mentioned to the jury, uh, and the report didn't go back to the jury. And if it had, they would have clearly seen that Dr. Prentke plainly knew exactly the facts of this case because they're laid out in a paragraph of great detail. This and, was misleading. And the, and the, 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 um, your client's attorney, which may have been you, I don't know, no. uh, was, um, uh, couldn't bring that out and redirect? I mean, well, in this other was, words, this why was, Dr. Prentke was testifying? Uh, she, she could have, I suppose, drawn that out and redirect. She did not. But she could not have drawn out the, the incorrect statement in closing argument because the closing argument statement was simply wrong. Now, she could have objected, but she did not. Um, now, obviously, the jury is going to be presumed that they, their memory is different than, than what the attorney says. You should ignore that. But we don't know whether they remember that. What we do know is that they've been uh, misled. Accidentally or intentionally, it doesn't matter. They're getting incorrect information. They're being told to disregard this person's opinion because he doesn't even know the facts of the case. And they don't have any corrective for that because they don't get the report. And if they looked at it for just a second, they would say, he does know the facts of this case. So your, let me ask you this. Your, your argument that, that these reports should be admissible, do, does it extend to reports of non-testifying experts? In other words, let's say the individual, the respondent here, uh, has three or four experts that have indicated he's not sexually dangerous, uh, but only calls two of them and just offers the reports of others, saying, well, here's a psychological report, too. Or is it just, is this, are you just I, talking about the reports of testifying experts? Well, I'm, I'm just talking about the reports of testifying experts in this case. 
I'm not suggesting what the law should be in for, for every case, but it, it seems plain to me. I mean, I don't understand my brother's reading of Section 14, frankly. I think psych psychological records and reports reports is very plainly, plainly refers to um, the defendant's experts. I don't know what else it could refer to. But, but experts that are non-testifying experts? I mean, you could hire a whole battery of well, people. Well, I, I think that, I mean, generally you're going to, well, most people don't have the funds to do that, but generally you're going to have, the, the court is going to require cross-examination. So I would think it would be people who are going to testify. Well, they're treating, they're, they're treating psychiatrists from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, and 2 years ago, who do not testify. That's true, and those re records and reports are, are routinely entered against the, defend, uh, the defendant or the petitioner. Um, so, I, I mean, perhaps, maybe, I don't know where it stops, but, you know, this court has said that the, the, a very broad you know, reading of the rules um, allowing all kinds of totem pole hearsay, all of these old reports, police reports, where crimes that the person hasn't been convicted of, all that gets to come in. And then the defendant's petitioner, the, his expert's opinions, and their version of the reports it doesn't come in. It, if, it doesn't. if one of the qualifying experts or qualified experts uh, ordered by the court uh, does not testify in one in this case, mm -hmm. in, 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 in one of these cases under Section 9, does that expert's report get admitted into evidence, do you know? I, I I don't know. This is actually the first uh, SDP case that I've done, so I'm not sure. Your, your but I, my feeling is not. No. Your yes. brother says no. Is that the, the QE has to testify? Um, I, I would also call into question my brother's reading of the, the notion that these are independent experts. Certainly, once a, a, a QE has decided that the person is an SDP, is he is an advocate for the government. These people are also appointed by the Department of Corrections, which is part of the executive branch. This is the government making a case against uh, an individual that is going to deprive him potentially of his liberty for the rest of his life. Uh, I, don't, I don't see how these are independent uh, experts. Certainly once they've made their opinion, they're not. And not only do you get the two QE uh, reports in, but you also get the CAB report. So you have this marshalling of forces against the defend, uh, defendant or petitioner in this case. Um, and he doesn't have the full means to uh, defend himself. Is it your view that this can be decided as a matter of statutory construction and uh, not as a matter of constitutional claim? Well, uh, as Your Honor knows, I brought the case originally under, only under the constitutional claim, in part because that was raised below in, in some ways. And um, nobody argued below that it was part of the statute. Um, and I think it can, actually. I'm not sure that the appeals court version of it is the best way, but I think the catch-all provision, which does read differently than Section 14, but I believe this court in uh, McCool, one of the McCools, and in uh, the appeals court said in, in Bladza, said that that could not mean just whatever evidence against the person. But, it also had but, to mean... But what do you do about... I, I, Reese's point that it needs to be otherwise admissible. So if you're just going by the rules of evidence, these reports don't come in, do but, they? But there have been two instances at least where the courts have, uh, where this court has approved uh, things that are, uh, documents that are not on that list uh, as f falling comfortably within the um, language in 14. Catch -all. But, and what, what are those? Those are in section 14. And in the case is Boyer, and that would be parole reports, parole records, and then Morales, which is a, uh, an appeals court case which allowed in um, uh, grand jury minutes and DCF records. D oh, DCF. Yeah. I, I actually wrote DSS in my brief, but it's no longer correct. Um, um, those are not specified in uh, Section 14 or Section 9, uh, but the courts in both of those cases reasoned that the judge was correct in allowing them in because they were similar enough to the kinds of records that, uh, that were specified by statute. I would argue that there's absolutely no difference in these cases between the defendant's experts and the Commonwealth's experts. Their reports, they're, they're looking at the same facts. 
um, they're offering different opinions. So to the extent, obviously, this has to be that if the Commonwealth, as it often does, calls somebody else who may be from the cab or somebody other than the QEs, and particularly if one of the QEs is, is saying that the uh, person isn't a sexually dangerous person, those reports, on your theory, would come in as well, correct? Yes. Um, Goose gander. A absolutely. And I'd also like to, I mean, there's a couple of cases, Connor is one that I remember, um, where this court has specifically um, uh, disapproved of uh, requests that, that it views uh, as trying to um, damage the fact-finding uh, ability of a jury or the judge in this case. Um, the fact is that reading the statute allowing the casual provision or whatever way to allow it in, um, to allow these reports in, enhances the jury's fact-finding ability because they get all of the information. And uh, on the other side of that, uh, my brother hasn't enunciated a single bit of prejudice. He hasn't explained why this harms the Commonwealth in any way. Uh, the argument is simply the statute says it, therefore it doesn't come in. Uh, so I don't see, there's no argument that this is going to somehow damage the, the Commonwealth or prevent them from being able to <coughs> pursue these cases, uh, raise the expense of what's going on. We're just talking about making the uh, presentation of evidence fair. Um, other than that, unless court has other questions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right.